Warning. We'll all have to approve that I'm recording. Um, so welcome, Allison. Uh, she's going to talk with us this morning about um, ways to strengthen your communication with your family members around financial matters. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Allison. And But one thing before I do, I want you to use the chat, um, not just to ask questions, but to provide comments or sort of your own experience. We want this session to be interactive and we want to have conversation and um, certainly be as candid as you feel like you can be because we want to really think about together strategies for talking with family members about this issue. So um, don't, you know, don't stay quiet, use the chat and we'll open it up for questions and comments as we move through. So I will turn it over to you, Allison. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I didn't do a talk last year, so um, I wish I was in person though, because I love coming to fame. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about relationships and money. And this is actually the first time I've done a talk on this topic. So we are going to see how it goes. I always do more technical things. Like I talk about how to get rid of your credit card debt. And, you know, if you're self-employed, how to smooth out your, your earnings. Um, so I've never, I talk about this on kind of a micro level, but I've never talked to a group about it. So as Mary said, I hope also that this will be more of a conversation. I, I at the end of every kind of little section, will ask for anyone who wants to um, contribute or if you've got tips or experiences to share, because I do think it really helps the whole group because I have limited experiences, you know? Um, and so, and if nobody ever contributes, this is gonna be too short and then Mary is gonna get mad at me. So you guys need to, like, just contribute whatever you're comfortable sharing. Cause I get this is coworkers. And so, you know, there, there's like a limited amount of comfort that you might have, but hopefully, um, you know, if you have good experiences that you are comfortable sharing, um, or questions, you know, something that has been, is that you're struggling with. I am, would be thrilled to have that. I also feel weird if I talk for a long time and nobody else talks. <laughs> this is a long time of hearing your own voice. Um, so the way I was thinking about this was who in our lives, you know, maybe should we be talking to about money in some aspect? And I came up with five categories of people that you might be having money conversations with. So the first, and we're gonna kind of do a deep dive into all of these. The first one is, you know, a spouse or a partner, um, something like that. Um, the second one, I keep calling it elderly parents, but it's just our parents. <laughs> they don't have to be elderly. Like they could be young, young parents. Um, I'm thinking of it more in terms of like estate planning and, you know, preparing for that kind of thing. So in my mind, it's elderly. Um, um, adult children, and then a totally different kind of conversation with minor children. Uh, and then the last category is other. So people like maybe siblings or friends or something like that. That one's kind of a short one, um, but it is something that actually has come up in a lot of my conversations with, with folks at Fame, but also um, just in my general financial coaching. You know, how do I talk to somebody who doesn't know my financial situation about money? Um, so for your spouse or partner, you, you know, you guys are partners in this whole thing. You should be communicating regularly about money. Um, and that's both on like a daily monthly basis of, you know, oh, the, uh, we're gonna need to get a car, I don't know, tires for our car, or we, you know, uh, something to do with our house needs repair, or we have to pay for summer camp. Um, and then also of course, like long-term, you know, what does retirement look like, you know, if, things like college savings or even a vacation goal that's off in the future. Um, so just, I, I always think both parties should be, usually one person is the person that pays the bills and the person kind of um, managing the money on a monthly basis, but both people should know what's going on. Um, and that's especially true, I think, for investing and for the like long-term um, planning. Sometimes it's one-sided. Sometimes one person does the daily and monthly bill paying and the other person does the investing. Um, so I feel like in my house, those month daily and monthly conversations are just happen like as we're passing each other or we're like making dinner and somebody is like, oh, by the way, you know, I don't know, something is coming up. And, and um, so we just kind of have like sort of a constant communication. Um, 
but I, oh, I know I was going to say if, if you weren't having those conversations, if you do have a partner or a spouse at home and you weren't previously having those, I'm really hoping, and I would love to know if this is true, whether the, these programs and also the financial coaching program kind of generated some of those conversations. I know a couple of people have told me that they have, you know, even just filling out that form I make you guys fill out at the beginning of the year. There's like a couple of people that fill it out, don't, don't give it to me. But then they say, oh, this actually really, kind of generated a conversation we weren't going to have. Um, so that's always a good starting point is if you are participating in this, that's, a, you know, you could talk about the form that you filled out for me. And what does that look like? You know, um, so then in terms of what do our money conversations look like? Like I said, you know, mine is often kind of just casual, letting each other know, alerting each other to something that's going on. Um, but I get, of course, I get a lot of clients in who are in financial distress. And what I mean by that is like digging out of debt or maybe trying to stick to a budget or, you know, they've maybe lost an income and all of a sudden or need to live on less. And so those, or even sometimes just getting a hold of their finances, because sometimes people come to me and they really just have, haven't ever paid attention. And so in that case, usually what I ask them to do is have a weekly money date. Um, and in that, and what they talk about, you know, cause they're like, well, what do we, what do we talk about? So usually I say, if it's really like, we have to live within this budget and we need to be tracking this throughout the month. Like, this is not something we can just go back to and see what happened. Um, we, I usually say, okay, you know, those people are very on top of like, what is going to happen over the next few days? Like what is upcoming? And so what I have them do is sit down weekly and then say, what did we, what did we think was going to happen last week? And then what actually did happen? And then going forward, what is coming up? You know, again, like a car repair or some other expense, maybe like an, you know, a quarterly insurance payment, what is coming up that we need to deal with? Um, and then anything else. So like, um, you know, I don't know, they, we need to do open enrollment or something, you know, something that is coming up that you need to deal with. Um, if, if, if you're not kind of at that level where you need to meet weekly, um, sometimes monthly can work. And that's more usually of like a review of what happened last month. Um, you know, especially if you do have a budget and you are, even if you don't have a budget, cause I don't have a budget, but I do track my expenses. And so I can look and say, what did I actually spend last month? Um, and reviewing that kind of depending on where you are, um, you know, with your financial stability. And then we, in our household, other than those daily conversations that we just have going back and forth, we actually talk quarterly about this stuff. Um, so at the beginning of the year, uh, we set, I say we, I mean, I set financial goals for us. And then I show my husband and he is very agreeable. So he agrees to whatever I say. And then, well, he, he will express if he, if he has a different opinion. He's also a CPA. So he's, we are kind of equal on the savvy, being savvy with money front. Um, and then on a quarterly basis, like when our investment statements come out, you know, retirement statements, then we, I kind of compile it into a, of course, a spreadsheet that I have. And I look at it like, what, so what was December 31st of last year? What, what is our goal for this year? And then like at Q2, where are we? Um, and then at the end of the year, because I do track my expenses every month, I come up with like a, an average spending in every category. So on, on average, what did we spend for gas in a month? You know, what did we spend for entertainment and groceries and all those kinds of things? Um, which is sounding like a lot when I'm saying it, but it's actually like a very small amount of our time. Um, and then- Listen, Can I just add yeah. something real quick as a reminder for the group? Um, as far as family members, spouses, partners, just as a reminder, these sessions, especially now that we're virtual, which once we return to, um, you know, in person at Fame after Labor Day, we're still going to host these virtually because not everybody is going to be in the office all the time every day. So, um, given that they're virtual, you're able to include family members in these um, Zoom sessions. You know, you can share the link, or they can participate with you. You know, wherever you are. Um, also the recordings are available. So that's something else that you can share, you know, perhaps 
this session or the Medicare session, I know that was really popular recently, um, you know, certainly share those links. And then last but not least, the Enrich tool, the digital financial wellness, your family members also have access to that for free as well. So, and I know Allison has encouraged, you know, if you want to include um, family members in that coaching session as well. Again, where we're virtual now, it's really, I think, a good idea to take advantage of those of those situations. So just wanted to remind um, remind all of you of that. Yeah, I mean, it's great that I, that's a really good idea about the recordings that wouldn't even have occurred to me. Yeah, I, I, when we were in person, I had one person who would bring her spouse regularly, which we loved, but the three of us had a great time. And then virtually one time before the pandemic, we had a snow day and I ended up having a meeting with the spouse that was not intentional. They were just working in the same office. But since then, yeah, I don't really talk about it a lot, but I'm happy to have, um, you know, your partner, your spouse, like sit in on our, because I think sometimes it's useful and then they can ask questions that maybe you didn't even realize that they had. Um, yeah, those are really good points. Um, and then kind of, I guess this is kind of along the same lines of communication is making sure your spouse knows how to access your accounts and also vice versa. So, you know, whether you have joint or separate, like everybody knows how to access everything. Um, I've also sent, this is getting off the spousal communication, but I've also sent a document to two of my family members saying, Hey, here's our estate planning attorney. He has the will, you know, here's the companies that have life. We have life insurance with, I don't put the amount, but here's the company name and here's our account number. Um, and I think probably I put where to put our, where to find our passwords in our house. Um, and so I need to update it because it's been, I would say at least 10 years since I've done that, but it's useful. So that way, if something happens to both of us, it's not just like total running around like a chicken with your head cut off because you have no idea, you know, they would know where to go to. Um, Oh, and then I've also heard, this is a great idea. It's not something that I've done yet, but people have a binder where they literally like have plastic sleeves and put in the passports, put in, you know, birth certificates, marriage certificates, you know, like I imagine if you have the title to your car, like whatever important documents. And then they just, it's like in case of fire, you grab it and all your important stuff is in there. And also it's just easy to access. If you are like, oh, I need my passport. It's always like I have lost my passport more times than I can tell you because I keep putting it in what I think is a very, very safe place <laughs> and it is far too safe and I have no idea. Social security cards. I've lost those too because I'm like, oh, I know exactly where they are and I 100% don't know where they are. Um, so anyway, I'm just throwing that out as a good idea. It's not one that I do, but I at some point maybe I will get there. I do that with an accordion folder. So oh, me, my husband, my son, we each have yep. our own folder. It's just easy. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, it's that, that kind of stuff is like, hopefully you'll never use it, but if you do, if you need it, it's there. And then you are always glad that you had it. Um, I was gonna move on to talking about talking to parents, unless somebody has something they wanna share. Spouses are weird, like that's like a weird situation. I can understand if people don't wanna share their, their challenges with talking to their spouse. Well, I will um, say, Allison, just yeah. um, anecdotally and, and just for my own situation, you know, the fact that we are uh, doing the will and estate planning this year as part of our um, financial wellness um, program, that's been interesting because I think, you know, I, I don't know for others on the, on the Zoom, but, you know, those are hard conversations, you know, to have to kind of force yourself and your spouse to think about, you know, the what ifs and the scenarios and the backup and the beneficiaries and all that. And I know, um, you know, some of our staff who signed up originally, there are um, some individuals who never got there because they couldn't come to a consensus about guardianship and beneficiaries. And, you know, so that's a tough, you know, that's kind of like next level. Yeah. Um, you know, talking about retirement or what are we going to do when we get old? I know my husband isn't a big fan of that. And then to get into like, what are we going to do when we die? That's even more, you know? So yeah. I think it's really forced us and others to go to places with these conversations that, you know, you really don't want to have, but they're really, really necessary. And, you know, your family members left behind will thank you for it. But that's been interesting, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah. When my mom, my mom wouldn't talk about like my dad tried to buy cemetery plots 
and she would not have it. She wouldn't talk about it. And then she passed away. And so my dad had to do, and he's very capable and she was also sick for a long, she had dementia. So she was sick for a long time. So it was not, you know, it, he was very capable of handling it, but I, why, I don't know. I mean, I am a person obviously who's comfortable talking about this kind of stuff, but yeah, it's really, some people are very sensitive about it. And it just, the thought of talking about it is, it's very difficult. It's, it's a bummer to hear that like people can't get past it enough to like do their wills. I'm, I get it. The guardianship thing. I don't want to say we didn't have a fight. We were more like, nobody is good enough to take care of our kids. <laughs> so we ended up deciding, originally we actually had my parents and then my mom got sick. So we had to redo our wills because she just wasn't capable of taking care of our kids. And so then it was like, God, of all of our siblings, I like them, but like, do I want them to raise my children? Like, so we're okay. And, and they're getting older. So hopefully we will not have to deal with this. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I always tell people like estate planning is, is not for you. It is a gift for your loved ones to, so that they don't have to make these decisions and they know what you want. Um, okay. So for parents, um, and when I'm talking about talking to your parents, I'm thinking in terms of like people who are like, I don't know if my parents have a will, like the same stuff that we're talking about. Like, I don't know, you know, like, I don't know if my parents are okay financially because they don't talk about it. And, you know, all you can do is judge based on what you're seeing, what looks comfortable for them. So this is a hard, hard conversation because a lot of, first of all, there's the whole parent child dynamic, of course, where they don't, a lot of times people are like, I don't think I should have to tell my kids anything about my finances. Um, but also it can look kind of like you're being a little money grabbing or like you're, you know, you're looking for your inherit, you're looking for information about your inheritance when all you are doing is wanting to know that they are financially stable. Um, so it can be a little prickly. And also a lot of times they were brought up, not just at the time, but also maybe in a family where you didn't talk about money. Um, and so that also can just make it like an added layer of discomfort on top of it. So how to start this conversation. The, I think Mary, what you said is uh, about the estate planning offered by fame. It's a great way to a great way to do it in general is just to share something about yourself so that it's not just like I am seeking information from you. It's um, so I think a great opportunity would be to say, you know, my work offered this amazing benefit and we were able, you know, we had a huge discount and we were able to meet with a lawyer. And then, you know, you can share something about it. Like, oh, they, they brought up questions we hadn't even thought of yet, or here's some things we had to decide. And then if all you want to know is, are there affairs, you know, are there, is there estate planning in order? Then you, I think it's fair to say, what about you? Do you have a lawyer? Like, you know, just kind of inquiring lightly to make sure like that they're kind of, they've covered those kind of topics. Um, That's exactly how I got my parents to write oh, their you will. Did? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, love I mean, it. <laughs> my mom's 40. So she's like, why do I need a will? And I'm like, well, I have one. So you should too. You're never too young. Yeah. Oh, that's great. No, I love it. Um, yeah, even other things like I remember I must have been like 25 and I was reading the Journal of Accountancy and it had an article about long-term care insurance. And at the time, so my mom did not have dementia at that point, but she had a really strong family history. And like, I was pretty sure we were heading in that direction. So I literally just handed the article to my dad. Like, I don't even think I said anything. I was just like, you should read this. And until, and then I never knew whether he got long-term care insurance. And until like six months ago, he was adding me as a, um, on his bank account because he's in his eighties. And, um, and I actually said, did you ever get long-term care? Cause I'm like, that's something I need to know if, you know, if something happens to him, I need to know, is that like a thing? And he said, no, he had never gotten it. I'm sure he considered it very thoroughly. Um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes even before, like for other people who are not getting like the estate planning benefits that you guys have, I'll say, you know, talk to him about a Like you heard something on a podcast or you read an article and use that as like, sh share a little bit about yourself. So it feels more like a sharing conversation and not like a, tell me all about your personal finance conversation. I mean, as far as if you are trying to figure out if they're financially stable, that's super delicate and you might not be able to get there. Like if they don't wanna share information about their finances, they don't have to, you know, they're grown ups, and they might have this attitude of, you are my child and you don't need to know anything. Um, so this is not super helpful, except to say like, it's a difficult conversation. 
you can try it and see what happens, but I don't think, you know, you can really force it. There's only so much you can do. Um, and then I'm getting a little out of my expertise, but in terms of if, if there is a concern with like cognitive decline or something like that early on, this is just what I've read. Um, Cause let's say someone has Alzheimer's early in the process, they can still agree. To, like they, they are competent enough to give you a power of attorney, stuff like that, or to put you on their checking account or whatever you need to, to do. Once it gets advanced, they can't agree to that anymore. They're just not competent. And so then it becomes, I think you could like get the courts involved and stuff. So all of that stuff, if you can do it ahead of time, even when, when you're not even worried about cognitive decline, like, and of course, I think this is more so for a parent who is not married. Because for like when my parents were married, I wasn't super concerned. They had each other and they were both like, they, they were fine. The other person could do it. Um, but if you have a parent who's not married, if, if something happens to them, then of course it would fall to the children. Um, and then of course, like siblings, if, if, there are, if you're like getting into that kind of conversation where like you do have a parent with dementia, then of course you'll have to have these conversations with siblings as well. Um, okay, so that's the end of the parents. I was gonna move on to adult children unless somebody else has something they wanna share. I feel like this is a topic that a lot of people have to deal with. It's like the talking to your parents about this kind of stuff. So yeah, if anyone has like anything that has worked well for them or although it sounds like Summer <laughs> did a great job. <laughs> Mom, you need a will. Um, well, not, not on this topic, but the per first one, uh, yeah. my wife and I basically, it seems like we do the same as you. Like she does the day-to-day -day bill paying and checkbook and all that stuff. And I've always done uh, like the investments and the retirement, mm -hmm. the future plannings and stuff like that. As far as, um, I think it just started like when she, when she first moved to the United States, like it was a few months or several months before she started working where I was working. So she basically was at home doing, and she, I was, so she then just she sort of kept that role and it works yeah. uh, fine for us. She, so I, it seems like it, it works best to have it divided up. We don't have to worry about the same thing uh, too, you know, too much. Yeah. So, I mean, I definitely see it divided along those gender roles as well. Like a lot of times it's the wife that's doing like the bill paying. Um, and sometimes it's because she's more also, she's way more organized than I am. So yeah, <laughs> that is also part of it. <laughs> um, but uh, like, of course, sometimes it's the wife. I mean, I know a few stay at home dads, but you know, I know a lot of stay at home moms. And of course they're the ones that are spending, you know, doing the groceries and stuff. But I wanted, I did want to say something. I forgot. I'm glad you said that because I read somewhere, I've read this multiple times, that something like, so when someone is, when a woman is widowed, something like 80% of the time, she will switch financial advisors. Like if, if they have a financial advisor and it's because she doesn't feel like she has a relationship with the financial advisor because sometimes she wasn't included in the meeting. And so I'm, I'm, that's what I meant to say is like, even if one person is, you trust one person, because sometimes somebody is well-suited to make like decisions, but both people really should be involved and understand what you have. Um, and that's like when I was saying I do my spreadsheet, it's really our, like the net worth. So it's like, here's the equity in, our, in the house and here's, you know, here's like our retirement. What does it look like? So that, because you don't know how many people I talk to who are like, I have no idea what's in my spouse's 401k. And I'm kind of like, you have a right to know that. And you should know that. You should have a sense of that for everything that's going on. Um, yeah, our financial uh, advisor always makes sure that we're both, he'll only do a meeting if we can yeah. both make it. He'll postpone that's it good. if we can't both make it. So yeah, it's good. no, that's really good. Um, yeah, and the same thing with the tax accountant. Like I work with a lot of women going through divorce and they're like, oh, I've never met with my tax accountant. And I'm like, you should, you should be there and hopefully be like listening, even if you feel like kind of overwhelmed by it. Um, okay, so moving on to adult children. So I, I have like three facets to this. There's two kind of short ones and then a much longer one. So the first one is really just like the reverse of what we were just talking about with the parents is like you talk. So if you have adult children, as I said, like, you know, they might have the same questions for you that you have for your parents. Like, do you have, is everything in order? You know, where do I find, you know, where do I find the will? Like, where do you have a safe deposit box? You know, how, 
how can I access, you know, how can they access your accounts if need be? Um, so this is obviously not for minor children, but just for people who have adult children, having that same conversation that you maybe want to have with your parents. Um, and then another quick one is just if they themselves need things like estate planning, like a will, um, you know, if they're 26 and living on the couch in your basement and they have no assets, they don't need a will. But if they own anything, if they own property or they're married, then they should um, they should have one. And the same thing with life insurance. So if they, um, you know, if they have someone depending on them, like obviously children, but but even even a spouse, like if if they own a house with somebody and the spouse would have to sell the house because she like he or she couldn't afford it just on their salary, um, you know, life and which may be fine. Maybe they would just say we'll sell, we'll sell the house. Um, but life insurance might be appropriate. So so. Edu helping what you've learned at fame and helping your adult children to understand what they should have. I mean, I was talking, this is three years ago, I was talking to my sister in her forties and she had no idea she should have life insurance. And I was like, how have you gotten so far? And I have not talked to you about this. So, and she had two little kids and she just said, oh, I thought that if my husband died, we would sell our house. And I was like, no, that's not what is supposed to happen at all. You know, you shouldn't have to change your lifestyle. That's what life insurance is for. Um, so sometimes it's surprising who doesn't know things. Cause I just assumed like she's a Dean of admissions in a law school. Like I assumed she knew things like this, <laughs> but it's just not on her radar. So she's, she's like not a person who thinks a lot about finance and money and stuff like that. Um, so then the big one is providing support to our adult children. And I see this constantly, um, and it's really hard to navigate because it can feel really gradual. You know, like I, when I graduated college and I moved to a different city, it was like, okay, we, you know, we helped you pay for college and now you're done. Like now you're on your own. And I took it and I did it all. <laughs> but now it's like, well, you know, things like cell phone bills, like, you know, you keep them on your cell phone bill because it's, you don't even think about it keeping them on your health insurance until they're 26. So it's, it's a little bit more gradual of like an adulting process. Um, and I think sometimes it can go too far and we don't realize that like, we shouldn't still be support, you know, they're now a grown up, and at, at their age, we were on our own. Um, even like car insurance, like obviously if they're moving out of the, out of the state, probably you're not gonna keep them on your car insurance, but if they're at home or like, you know, living near you, that might kind of still just naturally happen. So, um, what I would say is if you are providing, and I'm like looking around at this crowd, <laughs> like, I don't know that this applies to any of you guys, but I'm going to say it anyway. So if you are providing support to an adult child, I would say, just take a step back and look. So like, what kind of support are you providing? Like I had, there's this couple that I, they're the only people I see monthly. And that tells you a lot about <laughs> that situation, but we just went through their budget again and they're spending they're really in distress and they're spending $350 a month on their cell phone bills. And it turns out that that's a six person bill and three of their kids are, are grown and out of the nest. And it's really burdensome on them. And so we agreed, this is just like this week, we agreed that either they're gonna cut them off, like get your own cell phone, um, like, or the kids will start to reimburse them the 50 or $60 a month. Um, because it adds up over time. Three, that's, you know, a few, like a thousand dollars a year, more than a thousand dollars a year, way more, um, probably $1,500 a year for these three kids, for them to support them. And they're grownups. They're out on their own, living their own lives. Um, so like evaluating, what are you, how much support are you giving them? And then, and then looking at them, you know, if they're over, I'm going to throw out like the age of 25 and employed, you know, if you are providing support, why is there like, maybe there's a reason for it. And I do hear that a lot. I hear, and I don't, I can't, I have no way of evaluating whether these are valid <laughs> concerns. Um, but I mean, I had a client like two years ago and they were supporting all of their adult children in some, some way or another, including the 35 year old nurse. And, and she came to me because her marriage was suffering. Like they were struggling on a monthly basis. And, and her husband didn't want her to come see me because he said, I, he thought I was going to make them sell their sailboat. <laughs> and I was like, no, the sailboat doesn't cost that much. And it is bringing you joy. If you didn't have these expenses, you would be fine. You know, and, and in this situation, the, I think it was, a, 
I don't want to say miscommunication because I think it was more than that. The mom was saying to the daughter, the 35 year old daughter, if you're ever short, come to me and I'll help. The daughter was basically spending all of her money and every month coming to the mom for help. And I was like, this is not a tenable situation. That was one where I really had to like be very brutally honest because it was affecting her because the husband didn't, the husband is the father of the kids. It's not like a stepfather situation, but he was not supportive of, of supporting them. And the mom was a softy and couldn't like, couldn't bear the thought of not doing it. And I was like, How, when you were 35, were your parents paying your rent? I don't think so. And it was a situation where the daughter just didn't, she didn't want to take on more shifts at the hospital. And so, and she could get away with it because she would just call her mom and say, rent's due tomorrow and I don't have it. So um, yeah, I mean, I've never, certainly never seen anything at fame like that, but just evaluating, like, should I be support? Like, where was I at that age? Um, and is my child capable? And if they're capable, then why am I, you know, supporting them in this way? Um, and, and the, really the reason for this is not like, I mean, I do think it's doing them a disservice to, if they are capable of paying, of supporting themselves, but really it's more about your own financial security. And if you are sacrificing your own financial security at all to support someone who could support themselves, like you, they are going to end up supporting you. Cause again, I had a woman who. I, at the beginning of when I started this business, I had like three women in a row who were all in their early 60s, all approaching retirement, all of whom had drained their retirement accounts and were supporting their adult children. And one of these women, was her house was in foreclosure. And I was like, in what way are you helping your daughter? You are about to lose your house. Um, so you just need to make sure that you are on firm financial ground and any support that you are giving to your children, it is easily affordable by you. Um, what I tell people if, if, cause I have some, had some clients who are wealthy and they want to support their, you know, they want to get, they want to sh share some of that with their children. I always say, you know, if they, if, if there's grandchildren, like put money in the 529, like it takes pressure off of like, for me, if somebody did that for me, that would take a lot of pressure off of me as the parent, but it's not directly giving me like a cash handout. Um, so just, I think taking a look at what you're doing, what they're capable of, and then um, maybe making, having some conversations and making some changes around that. So I was gonna move on to minor children, unless, wow, this is actually good. This is taking more time than I thought. I was afraid we were gonna, it was just gonna be me talking for 30 minutes and then we were gonna be done. Allison, um, one of the, um, and I know Mila and the outreach team, we've, we've talked about this, but one of my favorite sort of analogies that I've heard other financial people say is, you know, it's kind of like when you fly on a plane and the flight attendant says, you know, in the case of an emergency, put your own oxygen mask on first before you put it on the, you know, help the person next to you. And I think the financial issues are the same way. If we don't take care of our own financial matters, there's going to come a point where the the child, the adult child is going to be taking care of us. And have we given them the skills to even begin to do that? You know? Yeah. So, no, I definitely think that's difficult. And it, you know, I have a, my son is going to be graduating from college next year. And I think, you know, one of the things that needs to happen is to set expectations and make a plan. So, okay. On graduation day, I'm not going to, you know, going to pull your cell phone and your car insurance, <laughs> but you know, um, you know, just setting expectations. And I think the other thing is paying attention to how they live, because I've said this to my own son, you know, you don't get to plead poverty to me that you don't have any money and you need my help. But then on the other hand, you're going out, you're traveling, you're going to concerts. So it's like, you know, there's yeah. a balance. And if their lifestyle, you know, not indicative of someone who needs help, that that really is something you should be paying attention to. Yeah, definitely. Even this woman who who is supporting her 35 year old daughter, she's like, oh well, she's a real foodie and she likes to go to Whole Foods. And I was like, that is not an excuse. But yes, definitely. Um, yeah, because there might be situations where somebody is taking a really low paying job and it is a struggle, and the parents absolutely might be willing to, you know, chip in and help for a while. But I think your point to expectations is really is really a good one. Um, you know, like we'll do this for now, um, but 
you know, this is not forever, you know, like, you know, car insurance, I could see that being a, like a real burden for somebody. Um, but yes, I think, I think outlining your expectations, otherwise it turns into somehow it turns into like a lifelong, a lifelong support that maybe you didn't even mean it to. So I think it can get out of hand, but yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times it's like, okay, once you're settled in a job, if you're making like a decent amount of money, you know, okay, then here's what, here's the things that you need to do. <laughs> like call, you know, you can call my, let my car insurance guy uh, and they'll hook you up. Um, yeah. Uh, could, I, could I add something? <clears throat> this is my yeah. other wardrobe. Um, uh, my oldest son is 26 now. And I think the other thing that it does, and I will say he is still on our family cell phone plan, but he does reimburse <laughs> us for that, but that's the extent of his support. Um, but when he was in college and, and gradually taking on more, he was someone who had not great money management skills. I'll always say when I do a session with teenagers, he was the kid who had spent his paycheck before he'd work the hours. You know, <laughs> that, that was his mindset. He's a spender. But, you know, because of what we do, we had these, all these conversations about it. And, you know, I think at 26 and he's got a retirement plan, he's got an emergency fund, he's got a savings fund, he has a budget. And the... I don't know if I'd call it joy that he gets from that, but happiness and sense of accomplishment because he can do that. He can take care of himself. Now, again, he's still happy to let me pay for some of the stuff sometimes, but, but by and large, you know, I think, I think we're also doing them a favor. Like I completely agree with Mary's point. Uh, and, and we talk about that a lot that we've got to be in good shape. And he's seen what happens when, you know, my mom isn't in good financial shape. So my kids have seen that. But it's also a real gift, I think, to them to, mm -hmm. to feel like they've got it and they can take care of it and they have those skills. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Because I didn't think, I guess when I was taught, like, chewing notes, it was more like somebody who's past that point. But that's a really good point, like helping your child who, let's say, is graduating college to do those things and talk about what they're going to get, you know, their 401k, you know, what it looks like and just help them to get started. And then they are on stable then, you know, they start out like anyone who's starting out at 26 or 25, whatever you said with, with like, you know, retirement funds and emergency funds, they're going to be fine. Also, because they, they know that they're not in that, like, I always say to my clients, it feels terrible when you're living paycheck to paycheck and you have to wait for the next paycheck to pay a bill. When you have savings, that feels really good. And once you've had that and you know what that feels like, losing it is very painful. And like, you immediately want to get back you know, to the security that you had where there's money in the bank and you know, you can weather some emergencies. Um, yeah, I think that, and that's actually kind of leads into the minor children because the minor children is not so much communicating with them about any, like, you know, something happens to you. It's more about um, educating them so that when they do graduate, they're in a good position and they understand how to make money decisions. Like if we just hide all our money decisions and we, act like, you know, we never say no, then to them, like money is infinite and they don't even understand how to make a decision, like how to evaluate it. Um, so I think the best thing we can do, and I do this all constantly is just talk out loud, like talk to your kids about money, making it totally normalized. Like you can imagine in my house, like it is a little bit too normalized. Um, but like, and you don't have to Mark, can I just make a comment about this? So I'm dealing with this with my 14 year old bonus kid right now who has zero sense of money. And I do have a question later, but I'd like to hear what they say first because he come, you know, he bounces back and forth between two very different homes with two very different levels of financial stability. Um, but he, you know, asked for something and when he was younger, his grandmother used to sort of get him whatever he wants and all of that. And so we're drawing boundaries like, no, you know, we have bills, we have things. And I asked him how much it costs to run our house. I'm like, this house, how much do you think? And he said, I don't know, like 500 bucks a month. And that really, it was really interesting to like assess where he was at. And so I think that would be my tip for like teenagers is like, ask, like quiz them. Like, how much do you think this or because he was so obviously so far off. I'm like, I wish it was only $500. And we talked about him like, we have a mortgage, we have all these things. And like, this is what it takes every month. And he was like, wow, that's a lot of money. And so it was, this was over dinner one night. And so I just think getting a sense of where he was, I had my thoughts, um, but hearing him say that and, and painting the practical picture for him, um, I think was really 
like eye-opening for all of us and saying like, okay, when you have a job, you can buy these things that you want. He's really, we're going to, next summer we start working because he'll be 15. Um, and he's reluctant, but we're trying to say like that financial autonomy that Milo's talking about, right? Like if you want a video game, you'll have the money to buy it. You don't have to wait for me and daddy to say yes or no. So that, that was just an interesting, it happened pretty recently, just like kind of a quiz to get his baseline, um, which was clearly far off. So yeah. <laughs> a good door opener for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I was just looking. Yeah. I would say like with my kids, they just see me being careful. And, and I even just talk out loud. Like this is such like a dumb example, but we were at the, this is a few years ago. We were at the grocery store. And at the time I was buying seltzer before I got my soda stream. And I was buying it in the bottles, like the, kind of the small bottles instead of the cans, because I was like, oh, they're bigger. So they must be cheaper, right? Like per, per ounce. But I noticed in the store, like at the tag that it wasn't cheaper, it was actually cheaper for the cans. And so that's the kind of thing I just talk out loud. Like, these are things we pay attention to. Um, and I, I think my kids are kind of turning into hoarders because I like am so emphasizing savings. And now I'm trying to like reverse the course and say, no, 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 we spend our money. It's okay to spend it. You know, if someone gives you a gift, but just be thoughtful about it. You know, do you, like I used to say when they were younger, like, do you want to buy candy? Like if they got $5, do you want to buy candy with that? Or do you want to save it up for a Lego set? And just using, like, it's always a trade-off. Every time we spend money, it's a trade-off. Um, and the one tool that I didn't, and it was not even me, but like, I, I have a friend who doesn't have kids and she constantly sending my kids Target gift cards. And that's been actually a really good tool because it's not like, well, first of all, they know, like if we go to Target to buy something, they're not like, hey, will you buy me this? Because they know 100% of the time I say no. <laughs> but um, unless it's something necessary. But like, if it's just a toy, they know that I'm going to say no. So they don't even ask. Um, but with the gift cards, it just gives them guardrails. Like they, it's not like, oh, grandma's here and her purse is always open. It's, it's like, here's what I have. I have like this $25 and it, forces them to look at the prices because it's not because otherwise they might just be like oh look at this game this is what I want and they, they don't it doesn't matter what it costs because they're not the ones paying but all of a sudden when they have a gift card it's like it's it's forcing them to say okay can I if these are the three things I want can I buy it with this gift card and then also the same thing with saving like do I save it and then combine it with my birthday money and buy something bigger or do I buy something today um and then the other thing is, and this is maybe more for younger kids, but like I read somewhere and I think this is really good advice. I don't ever say we can't afford that. I say like, we're choosing not to spend our money on that because I've heard that. And I think it makes sense. Like younger kids that can cause anxiety because then they're like, oh, well, if we can't afford that. Can we afford groceries? Or like, can we, you know, can we, like, we need to go back to school shopping. Like, can we afford this stuff? And it makes them feel like there's a scarcity of money when that's not the case. It's just you're just, you're choosing, you're making a, a, a deliberate decision not to buy something because it just doesn't fit in with your values. Um, or you're like, you've already spent, you know, you, we've already gone out to eat three times this month. So we're not doing it a fourth time. It doesn't mean we literally don't have the money to do it. It means we are choosing not to do it because we're choosing to spend our money on different things. Um, and then the other, the last thing I was going to say on this is with high school, like my oldest is a rising junior. And so that this is where the conversations are, bigger conversations are gonna to start to come in, of course. I haven't had them yet, <laughs> but you know, about college, about what we can afford, what is already set aside in his 529. Um, and then if, if loans are in the future, what do those look like? And how much, like what I'm envisioning is once we have a sense of like what that would look like, maybe it's just the federal loans, um, how much is that on a monthly basis? And then maybe even doing a sample budget to say, like guessing what they would, you know, guessing what he would make and then saying, okay, if you spent this much on rent and then you spent this much on these other things, this is how this fits in. So they have some, they can visualize how burdensome the um, payment is. Um, oh, and then I have a book recommendation for anyone who has um, minor children, or if you know someone who does, it's called um, Make Your Kid a Money Genius, even if you're not. I might've recommended some of you guys already by Beth Kobliner. Um, and it says it's something like for kids from three to 23. And it's, it's great. It covers everything from like insurance to saving, to donating, to like investing. And it's like, here's how you talk to a preschooler about this. Even things like insurance. It's like, we talk about taking care of our choice and taking care of our things. Um, and then it says, here's how you talk to an elementary school student. Here's how you talk to a young adult about these kinds of things. 
Um, it's a really great book for anyone who has kids of that age, especially if you're like, I don't know how to talk, you know, or like, I don't know how to address this. Um, we've tried things like allowances, like, I, and it's totally on me that I, everything, like it goes for two weeks and I forget. And then we've never done it. We never do it again. <laughs> so those kinds of things are hard to navigate. Um, but yeah, it's- What, what was that? Uh, I didn't catch the name of that oh, book. Oh yeah, it's called Make Your Kid a Money Genius. Mm. And the author's name is Beth Kobliner, K-O-B-L-I-N-E-R. I think I'm for like a total firm believer that people can't be changed. And like, as far as you're either a spender or a saver, I think there's like, it's, my brother growing up, he's two years older and like he would always just blow his money. And then I was always cheap or saving, whatever you want to say. And then I'm noticing with my son and daughter, she's conservative and he has to have awesome stuff all the time. So then, you know, right. Even now he's got a boat and all this stuff and it's, it's, I think you are who you are. I, I don't know. I guess the best thing you can do is just try to lead them or educate them, but they're going to be who they're going to be. Yeah. I oh, mean, I, I changed. I mean, uh, well, <laughs> well oh. mostly out of necessity, but, and I did, you know, choose to grow up really, really quickly, but I got married when I was 18 and I really didn't have a whole lot of financial education. And yeah, but my husband, um, you know, Help me learn to be really good with money. I used to be really, really bad. The only relic is my, um, you know, toxic relationship with Dunkin' Donuts. That's all that I have left over. Um, but now I'm pretty cheap. But I used to be, yeah, spend the money before. Yeah, and I, I even think, worked. <laughs> I think yeah, that sometimes happens. The other thing is showing them the benefits of let's say if you do like things like compound interest. I mean, I just was telling my daughter who's too young to work, but I was like, if you work, let's say you earned a thousand dollars. I would, if you put 200 in a Roth IRA, I would match that. And she was like, what? <laughs> and I, she doesn't, we haven't even gone into compound interest. Like what would that look like over time? But I think that helps to, to like look at a goal. And some people are just, some people are like very futuristic and like interested in the future. and. I think those of us that are like that are more inclined to save for the future. And some people just can't picture it. And so they're more all about today. When I get clients, I do sometimes get clients in who are like, I can't stop my spending. And so for them, I'm like, let's put up guardrails. Like let's do automatic deposit into these accounts and get them so that you can't see them. And then what's left in the account that you can spend. You can spend as much as you want, but it's limited. And like, we're squirreling money away um, so that they can reach their goals and then they know what they have available. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that like people are inclined a certain way. Um, and I don't know if that does change except for people like Summer <laughs> who are clearly dedicated. I was just going to add, I, you know, I, I agree, Jeff, I think, you know, we, we have sort of this money mindset that is developed very young and there's a lot of research around birth order. So like you and your brother and then your kids and, and does birth order play into it? I do think that we can change though. And I, I think that, you know, Milo's example with Alex and, and many others, you know, Summer, I think we can change. I think that it's knowing your money mindset and whether you're conservative or you're more of a spender, like knowing that and, and acknowledging who you are is huge. And then I, I really have always found it interesting, the book by Sarah Newcomb loaded and some of her research and her study. And, and we do have the book in the lending library at fame, but you can also get it on Amazon. You know, she talks about wants versus needs, and she doesn't really like that whole concept because in, in her mind, and for a lot of researchers like everything's a need so um identifying what it is that purchasing that item fulfills in you whether it's the dunkin donuts obsession whether it's the going out to dinner or going out to bars or going whatever it is everything we spend money on is fil fulfilling some sort of basic need now it may not be a need that you have to have in order to survive but emotionally it's fulfilling some sort of need. And so identifying what that is, like with your brother, Jeff, you know, there's something that that's fulfilling, that's fulfilling a need. And I think if we can kind of get in touch with 
what is it doing for me? What is it accomplishing for me emotionally? Then we can start to think about, okay, how could I do that a different way? Um, you know, she talks about the Dunkin' Donuts being a social thing for a lot of people, you know, just coming in and you're getting the coffee and it's this communal thing that we do, you know, meals out, bars, all of that can fall into that. And how can you fulfill that in a different way? So I don't think we change, but I do think we adjust how we fulfill our needs when it comes to spending and our needs change. Like maybe when we're really young, we have to have all the latest and greatest because we want to be cool and we want to fit in and it's feeding our self-esteem. But then as we get older, we're kind of like, you know, I don't really care about that anymore. So I'm going to go to a thrift shop or I'm going to buy a used car or whatever that is. So if you haven't read the book or kind of taken a, you know, a look at that whole psychology of money thing, I think I think it's really interesting. And um, thinking about when you buy stuff that you don't need to literally survive, what need does it fulfill for you? And then having that conversation with your kids or your adult children or whatever, if they're big spenders. So anyway, I could go on and on about that one. You no, know, I had a therapist client recommend that book to me. Um, I haven't read it yet, but now you're yeah. making me think I need to read it. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I'm actually almost done. We're actually perfect on time. Um, the the last category, like I said, was like siblings, friends, and that's more really about spending. Usually it's like you're feeling pressured to, to host an expensive holiday or go in on a group gift that is like more than you would normally spend. Or like what I see sometimes is vacations. Like, oh, you know, my friend or my sister, like I go on vacations with her and I can't afford them. And then as soon as we get home, she's sending me emails about going to Hawaii. And so usually it's all, it's like invariably, I can't say hundred percent of the time. It's usually, they don't know. Like they see what you're spent. They don't know your financial situation, even siblings. Um, and so like, if you have been going on vacation with them, they think you can afford it. And so then they're like, Hey, let's do another trip. And it doesn't occur to them that it's not in the budget. So you like the best thing to do is just be honest. This is one time at which our social like awkwardness of talking about money will work in your favor because this will shut down the conversation. So if you can literally just say that's not in my budget for anything, any level of like, let's go out to dinner or let's go to Hawaii. You can just say it's not in the budget or we're saving for something else or something like that. They're, if they have any tact, they're not going to pursue it. And from, and going forward, they're going to be much more sensitive. Um, to like maybe what is comfortable for you. So, I mean, I've seen it a few times and it has been successful, you know, like, so, and in one case, I actually thought it wasn't going to be, I was, well, I thought she was never, like the person was never going to bring it up. And she came back to me and said, I actually talked to her and she's never brought it up again. But it, it didn't, it didn't hurt their relationship or anything like that. It was just she, that the other, usually it's just a, not an awareness of, you know, they don't know what's going on in your personal life. And so if you, I mean, it's easy to say something like, oh, you know, if I have a, a sophomore in high school, we're saving for college, you know, that's like very socially acceptable. But a lot of times it's just not what, you know, people don't know what you're going through and they might, a lot of times we think everyone else is in a similar financial position. So like, I always say this, like, if you have a lot of credit card debt, you kind of assume soon around you does. Um, or if you are like maxing out your 401k, you, everybody else could do that if they just did, but it does not, not always. Pay. And so somebody who's maybe like what in your mind, pressuring you to do something you don't want to do. It's usually because they don't realize that it is not affordable for you. Um, so sort of like just being honest, you can say it's not in the budget or we're saving for this other purpose or whatever. You don't have to share a lot, but that usually like shuts it down real quick. <laughs> So that is actually all I had. Um, so I don't know if anyone else has something they want to share that is like a burning desire to talk. Allison, I think an example of, of one of those situations that's tricky, especially for young adults and, you know, sort of up to a certain age is the whole um, wedding and baby, you know, that whole time. And I remember, yeah. I don't, it's not an issue for me now, but I think a lot of young adults really struggle with that. You know, they get asked to be in weddings, their friends are, you know, there's that whole age, you know, time period 
or all your friends, like you're, you're in a wedding, you're going to a wedding, you're buying. Sarah's just going, yes, yes, yes. You know, so it's, yep. it's that's <laughs> tricky and people, I mean, I know it, it's good to be honest. Yeah, I it's know. Hard to do because not only are you saying no to whatever right. they, but to be candid about your own financial situation. So I don't know, you know, um, I don't know how you set those boundaries. I know. And it's also kind of saying like, I don't love you if I'm not yeah, going to your wedding yeah, because exactly. I don't love you. Sarah, do you have an Sarah idea? Something to say. Okay. So my, it's so convenient. You just brought that up because my husband and I just had this conversation last night. Um, one of his friends asked him to be in his wedding in Pennsylvania in December. And that's expensive. Driving down, it's a 10 hour drive probably. We're going to need a hotel room. You don't want to drive down 10 hours, do a wedding, drive back. That's awful. And so his friend is thinking, oh, it's just a quick drive, you know, a very college minded. And so we finally had the conversation where I was like, look, you have to tell him we cannot financially do this right now. If you are willing to allow us to stay with family or anything like that to offset the cost, we'll do it. We want to be there for you, but we really can't swing a trip to Pennsylvania in the middle of Christmas season. Um, and so, I mean, I think it's just a matter of being really transparent because our friends that age sometimes really need that reality check of like, you are asking something financially of me, um, because, you know, we have a lot of very, very young friends and I'm saying that as a 23 year old and they truly <laughs> do not realize, you know, what paying those bills is actually like. So, uh, transparency works for me. I'm fine with it. I, you can know I'm poor. It's fine. <laughs> like well, Me too. Like, to pay. <laughs> I'm a new mom. So there's a lot of pressure. Oh, when are you going to have another one? And I just straight up say, I cannot afford another kid. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, people really well, like daycare is a thousand dollars a month for one child. And that's also why we didn't have a wedding because I'm too cheap to. And that's what I tell people. I never had a wedding because I'm too cheap. <laughs> Yeah. Sarah, for your situation, I might say, yeah, like if, if it's easier just for your yeah. husband to go and, oh. and if they can, if he can like crash in someone's house, like you were saying, like crash on someone's couch, like that makes it more affordable. So sometimes it's like, okay, you can go, I'll stay home. At least, you know, your husband's there with his friend. Um, but of course, only if you can afford it, you know, like, cause there's still maybe the tux rental and there's, a, I mean, hopefully the gift either way, like I, hopefully you send them a gift, um, even if it's modest. But yeah, I mean, being, being like, sometimes people have like four or five weddings in a year they're invited to, and you have to make a choice. You have, and um, yeah, that's a rough one. And there's not, not an easy answer, but if they're, you know, if they're really your friends and they care about you, they're going to appreciate, you know, they're going to respect that you're saying, I can't, it's like, this is not financially feasible. It's gonna, it's gonna, or I'm gonna have to go into debt for your wedding. Like if they're your friend, they shouldn't want that. Um, so I don't know, that's not super helpful, but <laughs> it's a tough situation. And it's at that age, like mid twenties, it's like a wedding on top of wedding on top of wedding. So yeah, at the time that you can least afford it for sure. Yeah, I got invited to a wedding when, uh, I, yeah, I thought I was on mute, but I'm not. And uh, <clears throat> it's like right after college, well, a little bit after college. And uh, my friend was, parents or father owned north center uh foods and so they plenty of money yeah come down to marco island in florida for our wedding you gotta take a boat out there and i remember the seinfeld episode it's called an invitation but it's like you want to get credit for inviting me knowing me i'm not going to go to that <laughs> no way it's an invitation <laughs> yeah that's a rough situation it's yeah. true yeah well, thank you so much, Alice. And we're at 10.03, so we're going to conclude. I encourage you all, for those of you that are participating in the coaching sessions, you know, we have our third um, coaching, our final coaching in August, Allison. -ish. Yeah, I need to, I'll work it out with Ethan, but yes, um, in August. And then I think a few in September, because some of them we did kind of yeah. late. So that was, yeah. it would be. So short. I'm going to totally just like put it on Allison. You know, if you have a spouse or a family member mm -hmm. that, you know, you need to have a difficult conversation with, just bring them along to that coach. Oh, yeah. And, and she'll just, she'll just handle it for you. Right. Alice? I have learned how to be very diplomatic. Um, 
So we yeah, appreciate your time very much. And thank you everyone for um, being on the Zoom today and for participating. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, it was good to see you guys. Thank you. All right, bye. Yeah.